with another passion. We are here today with Ms. Priyanka Bhattacharji. She is skilled in special education. She is a clinical psychologist who has also uh, worked with hospitals and healthcare centers. She is skilled in special education, mental health counseling, stress management, autism spectrum disorder, and developmental psychotherapy. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And uh, a very good morning to everyone. And it gives me a beautiful pleasure to be a part of this initiative by Psychologues Magazine to have taken this initiative uh, of uh, celebrating the Suicide Prevention Week so that we can spread more of awareness and we can together fight against this public health condition. Uh, I congratulate the initiative of Psychologues team and uh, so thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, so I guess uh, we understand the, you know, uh, the, in, like, you know, the uh, interest for which we are all here. Uh, so as uh, uh, the, the moderator has rightly introduced me, uh, just give a brief introduction. My name is Priyanka Patechaji. I'm a clinical psychologist practicing in Bahati Assam. Uh, so apart from the lot of uh, mental health initiatives, the work that we are doing, one of the major work that every clinical psychologist required to do is the amount of awareness that we can spread at both individual and at a professional level. So collaborating with Psychologues Magazine in this particular initiative, I'm very happy to be a part of this uh, uh, Suicide Prevention Week. And without, you know, getting much into the detail, we all know the, you know, the causes, the, the, the condition of suicide and the kind of, you know, scenario that we have in India. Uh, my understanding and my, intent, uh, my intention to be a part of today's discussion was just not to speak, uh, you know, speak about the technical concepts, what causes them, what is, you know, everything that we know all together, right? But we have to go further beyond this in identifying the challenges, which actually prevents us from spreading more of awareness. So there are certain lacunas, there are certain areas that we'll have to identify so that we can you know, overcome the challenges that we face while spreading the awareness, right? The kind of uh, you know, stigmas that we uh, fight as a whole towards the perspective of mental health uh, in general and suicide in particular. So today the topic that I had decided to speak about is you know, understanding suicide as a consequence of uh, you know, symptom, as, as a symptom of, symptom of mental health condition or it is a consequence of a stigmatized mental health perspective. I think understanding these two aspects of suicide and many more are very important when you talk about suicide prevention, suicide risk management, and you know, other aspects. So uh, when we talk about suicide, it's a very you know, common understanding that, okay, if, um, if an individual has a suicidal ideation or uh, have, have caused a death by suicide, I mean, you know, it's, it's a very common judgment to come to a conclusion that, oh, okay, maybe the individual had depression. That's the first thing we, you know, tend to identify or we tend to think, but it's much beyond that, actually. Suicide as a symptom of mental health condition, it's not only a symptom of depression, but as a symptom of mental health condition, we see it across various different psychological uh, conditions. Very importantly, of course, in depression, we have it as a you know, very important secondary symptom of uh, uh, depression when it comes to you know, ICD understanding. We also get to see suicide as a symptom in bipolar affective disorder, uh, you know, in, in uh, episodes of uh, depression, in episodes of uh, uh, you know, uh, dysthymia. We also see it in emotionally unstable personality disorder in the impulsive type or in the borderline type. In impulsive type on borderline type, together when we talk about emotional unstability personality disorder, so the emotional dysregulation is a cause or a trigger for a suicidal ideation, self-harm or you know, uh, causing, causing a, a huge harm to himself leading to suicide. Okay? So it's not only that we talk about only depression, that if there is suicide, that there is self-harm, because when we talk about suicide, we also have to talk about suicidal ideations. We also have to talk about self-harm. Not every self-harm actually culminates to uh, suicide, but it's absolutely the you know, same spectrum of self, uh, causing self-harming behavior, right? So in emotional unstable uh, personality disorder, be it in emotional, like you know, impulsive type or in the uh, borderline type, 
we see it as self farming as a very very you know significant and a very common uh, uh, you know symptom uh, be it in terms of like uh, you know way to cope with the situation uh, to uh, release the intensity of the mental energy the individual has got engaged into during that particular condition um, the impulsiveness you know it, i mean the emotional regulation is so much high that you know in order to release the tension impulsively the individual takes self harm as a mechanism to release that particular uh, stress and to release that particular mental pressure apart from that we also see it in a lot of psychotic spectrum of disorder be it schizophrenia spectrum delusional disorders you know uh, wherever we have psychotic symptoms of hallucinations and delusion a lot of patients uh, in in the uh, you know psychotic spectrum be it schizophrenia be it any other uh, you know uh, psychotic condition we also see suicide there are also at times when there are hallucinatory voices which actually governs which will actually com- com- uh, commands the individual to take life okay so we also see suicide as a you know consequence of a hallucinatory voice in cases of schizophrenic uh, spectrum or you know uh, psychotic spectrum of disorder delusional disorders okay so uh, apart from that there are a lot of other form of it conditions even if it's not just uh, depression borderline personality disorder or emotionally unstable personality disorder uh, bpad bipolar mood, uh, affective disorder or in cases of uh, uh, psychotic spectrum disorder we also see it in certain comorbid conditions even if there is uh, there are anxiety spectrum disorder but the individual has very poor coping skills the individual has very inadequate resilience inadequate social support in those conditions also we see you uh, know self harming or suicidal ideation or suicide as one of the primary uh, symptom or manifestation okay uh disability is another uh, you know area that where we see suicidal ideations and uh, uh, you know self harm and uh, suicidal behavior occurring apart from that there are also certain conditions where suicide is resulting out of certain prolonged physical illness patients who are suffering from uh, prolonged uh, you know health issues diabetes uh, cancer acquire disability in order to you know uh, in, in finding a difficulty in adapting to the new acquired you know condition of life as a result of a, uh, a prolonged uh, health disease a palliative care or in cases of uh, you know acquired disability we also see you know suicidal behavior suicidal ideation okay uh, apart from that uh, also a lot of life events which actually leads to uh, you know suicidal behavior ideation or in fact uh, you know uh, taking one's life so a lot of side of, uh, you know life events that we are job loss uh, loss of uh, you know uh, loved ones um, separation in- marriage family issues uh, spouse issues and domestic violence and so on and so forth so there are also at times we see certain cases in the clinic that if the person has suicidal ideation or self harm it's not typically because the person has depression or typically the person has uh, any of the other psychiatric condition but it's because of the intensified or the chronic nature of stress which is making the individual incapacitating and inadequate which is re, you know causing a lot of pressure on the individual so in such cases and when we have the overall you know the perspective the kind of stigma attached towards mental health conditions towards various life issues that also makes things so very difficult for a person a lot of times we also come across cases where an individual had uh, you know uh, had caused death by suicide but there were no prevailing understanding of some kind of a you know psychiatric illness maybe it had got so much unnoticed maybe people in the family or the friends did not even see the behavioral change or it is just because some kind of an impulsive uh, behavior which might have occurred during that time or it could be because resulting out of some kind of a very inadequate coping uh, uh, you know mechanism in during that time so so, so many things coming together so uh, when we talk about suicide prevention i guess the very important thing that we need to build up an awareness and understanding about is a lot of factors which are associated with it be it mental illness be it physical illness be it the social support be it the family support be it the uh, you know adequate coping mechanisms and resilience in the individual okay 
so these are the very important things when you talk about uh, you know suicide prevention the very first thing that we have to understand are what are the risks involved what are the protective factors so again i'll not go much deeper into understanding risk factors or protective factors but i'll just you know touch up uh, a little bit overall uh, because i mean these are very commonly talked about things that what precipitates an individual or what predisposes an individual to cause self harm or to uh, develop a suicidal ideation or to uh, you, know, you know initiate and develop suicidal behavior so there are a lot of you know precipitating factors uh, any kind of uh, you no know, stress or life even any kind of uh, you know um this pandemic situation has also caused a lot of instances in the current time to you know give an example uh family issues marital issues and i mean so on and so forth there are a lot of predisposing factors as well which are you know governing in the individual's life that very underlying factor but at the same time it is making the individual vulnerable to develop a suicidal ideation or any kind of suicidal behavior for that matter if there is any kind of a genetic contribution of uh, parents uh, you know uh, having death by suicide or parental you know self harming behavior we also get to see a lot of cases uh, i have dealt myself a lot of cases um, there was 13 year old child who has developed uh, you know self harming behavior out of social learning because the mother also had you know self harming behavior and the child has seen them. the child has seen her doing it right in front of him ever since the child was around 4 5 years old so he has understood that as a uh, you know learning mechanism or, or a kind of a, you know social learning thing in order to make things done of his own way or in order to uh, you know cope up with a particular situation the child resorts to self harm right so he has he has numerous cuts and numerous you know social uh, learning suicidal uh, activities that you know, self harming activities that he has initiated all over his body okay a lot of times we also see that uh, you know uh, uh, in this particular case particularly in this particular case this 13 year old child uh, he his i mean uh, his intensity of cuts are not that severe right because his intensity to take his own life is not much but he has understood this self harming behavior as a way to cope up with his uh, situation so anything goes wrong there is an exam there he doesn't want to go to school there is an upcoming exam for which he is not prepared so he just make a self harm behavior so he just you know have a very uh, superficial cuts or superficial so there is there profuse bleeding there so many complications but the intensity is the lethality is not severe but then self harming behavior are existing and they are very very severe because the child doesn't know and a lot of times in cases such like these in in you know small in, in adolescents where there are uh, behavioral problem having uh, self harm as one of the you know instances of manifestation or in impulsive type uh, personality cases or in borderline personality cases so i mean the loss of life could happen very accidentally a lot of time the intensity is not to take their life away but to release that stress release the kind of mental pressure that they are experiencing at that particular time and causing a self harm they believe that you know that particular pressure is going to get released but it's such a maladaptive you know coping mechanism that individual uh, uh, is developing over the time right so these things are also very important to address when we talk about you know suicidal prevention we talk about suicidal uh, Uh, ideations and uh, self harming behavior as a whole because we have to see the perspective of a very larger end and it's just not you know uh, depression happening only because of uh, uh, depression or uh, or out of you know substance abuse cases of course in substance abuse cases we see a lot of cases of self harm and uh, and uh, causing death by suicide a uh, lot of times in the withdrawal phase when it becomes very incapacitating for the individual to cope up with the withdrawal symptoms so uh, that is a reason that you know we see suicide as a symptom of any other any kind of a mental health condition and when we talk about suicide earlier we knew that uh, the laws were a little different when it came to legal aspects they have been different when it comes to suicide but now after the mental health act of 2017 there are a lot of changes and there's a lot of legal perspectives that have changed towards suicide earlier the perspectives were very different and it was not an individual centric and it was it did not give much of importance to the mental health aspect of the person who uh, might have survived a suicidal attempt but now it's much more mental health centric because in order to understand the fact that 
it is a symptom of mental health condition right and after that uh, there has been a change in the perspective there have been decriminalization of uh, suicide so any individual who has survived a suicidal uh, you know self harming behavior suicide or attempt they are actually being taken for treatment and not something else but i think the prevailing society number one they do not know much about this particular decriminalization they do not know that you know they have been a very huge uh, initiative in the society by the government agencies to develop this particular uh, you know mindset towards mental health and suicidal behavior but i guess when we are creating an awareness about suicide we also have to create awareness about the steps that we have taken in our country about this decriminalization of suicide uh when we talk about this decriminalization of suicide you know somewhere we are touching this particular perspective of the uh, the the stigmas that is attached towards mental health and uh, in general and and suicide in particular so talking about this uh, uh can i can i share my screen uh, will that be possible yes i'll just briefly show two uh, slides where i'm just you know given certain few situations and interpretations yes ma'am i can do that yeah Uh, i think the screen sharing is disabled if you can please enable me yes ma'am Now, you can check. Yes, I'm able to see this. Okay, so uh, this is a small slide which I wanted to uh, share. Yes. Now, when we are talking about the perspective that people in the society. Uh, have towards uh, mental health towards um i know suicide in particular so these are certain situations which we often come across in the uh clinic where we have to address a lot of these conditions at the same time when we are talking about mental health so only because someone has a mental health condition i have depression people are going to point fingers people are going to talk about it people are going to mock about it people are going to gossip about it people are going to you know try to find conclusions and judgments so what must have happened and there you know there are so many things to look forward for there are so many positivities in this world i don't know why people get depression right and people start talking about it as if having a mental health condition is a crime and that particular feeling is in fact pushing someone towards taking their because they are not being accepted they are not being seen in a way uh, you know that they are part of the society and they are someone who could uh, be you know suffering from diabetes or hypertension is the same thing like you know having a mental health condition but no when it comes to mental health condition you are actually seen in a very different way people are pointing fingers people are talking about you okay if a person is a divorcee be it a male or a female if the social stigma people talk about them people you know what must have caused the divorce what must have caused the separation oh if it is a woman i'm sure they did. i'm sure she did not adjust with the situation well and all these conditions that particular thing is pushing that particular you know stigmatized mental health perspective is pushing the individual to take a you know drastic step of these a kind of as we said ideation or some sort of behavior right body image issues are so much common in our uh, in our society someone is lean and slim you know oh my god you have lost so much of weight why are you so much thin that's also a concern that that is also a talk of the town if someone is gaining weight what is wrong with you right they they also have a perspective that and why are you gaining so much of weight so body image things are so much challenging for an individual and they do not consider the kind of you know impact someone's comment on how they look is actually impacting the individual in question but all the all the people they think is you know it's cool to talk about this 
it's okay we are just trying to you know push you to look better we are trying to you know push you to have a healthy life but that's not a healthy life or healthy perspective you are actually contributing towards that individual right these are very common things that we come across in our clinic this is one of uh, the very recent things it just two days back so this person he said that uh, you know he is taking therapy uh, for certain mental health condition and uh, he actually had to leave his job previous job to initiate his therapy because number one he couldn't tell this in the office that if he is suffering from a mental health condition because if he would have said that he fears that he would lose the job and since he has to undergo treatment he will not be given any kind of a medical leave or anything so he had decided to leave the job and initiate therapy so after two weeks of therapy uh, he is still undergoing therapy but at least by you know uh, god's grace he has got another job opportunity so he has joined that again but he tells me that you know i can't come for therapy i cannot take medical leave for my therapy if someone comes to know in the office i'll lose this job again okay so this is the pressure that individual is fighting with okay and uh, it's not uh it, it's not the mental health, mental illness it's not the mental health condition which is uh, i mean i mean which is causing difficulty to the person but it is the perspective which he is fighting how society will see him after he tells that i have a condition like this so it's the perspective which the individual is fighting with that is that makes it makes things more difficult it's much more difficult than you know uh, the mental health condition itself i mean there are medications there are therapy for the mental health condition and undergoing the entire process you will still get better but how will you deal with the societal you know perspective that they are going to tell you about this this particular patient patient tells me that ma'am even if when i get fine after i i get cured uh, and later on if people find out that i had this condition you know at least 10 years back will they see me with a wrong eye will they still talk about me this is this is the concern i mean this is the thought process an individual is fighting with they are not concerned i mean they they are still able to deal with the fact that okay i have depression i have ocd i have any other kind of a mental health condition but i'm more diff- it's more difficult to fight with this particular aspect it's more diseased that how the society is going to see me what will people tell about, tell this about okay in fact a very recently i come to know that a colleague of mine uh he earlier had uh, uh, you know schizophrenia and uh, he is he is into medication and purely under control although his medications are on and he is in complete control and is completely into uh, uh, you know uh, betterment and improvements a lot of improvement and it's been very long time now uh so he 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 actually hesitated to tell about uh, his schizophrenia to his uh, you know uh, when he was joining a new job but some kind of a guilt stricken idea came up to him and after joining after two days of joining he went and told his manager his boss that sir i have i think i have uh, you know uh, I, i did not tell you something he said what uh, sir i have schizophrenia he said i'm on the medication but uh, it's in control but i just thought i should you should know about it. so the manager tells him that uh, i understand what you're going through i give you one month of salary and we'll look for a replacement now this is the kind of you know perspective that we have so i mean suicide or self i mean suicidal ideations and the self harming aspect or the worthlessness to live in this world becomes more not because of this mental health condition but because of the society the kind of pressure the individual is facing i mean what would this person do is it is this a crime is it a is it something that he has done wrong that he was diagnosed with schizophrenia 6 7 years ago he is into medication but he is completely fine he is he is cured that he, his maintenance medications uh, do keep uh, you know uh, continue right but then how is this person going to you know take care of his family how is how is this person going to take care of the fees of this of of his children and these are the stigmas which are actually causing more of the suicidal ideation and self harming behavior now this is society as a whole like we all a part of the society as an individual as a family member as someone's sisters as someone's mother as someone's uh, you know partner as someone's wife as someone's 
a friend, someone's colleague, we all, every individual, every one of us, we are making the society. This is a larger picture. Next, when we come to talk about in Indian, uh, in, in the family perspective, right? So these are again very commonly. I could not find uh, Indianized pictures on Google uh, pictures to you know describe this uh, situations. Uh, you know the kind of tags that I have come up with. These are very common things which parents come and ask me when I'm dealing with a uh, with their child who is suicidal, who has suicidal ideation. or has history of multiple self harm okay how can my child has mental illness it's an absolute you know in acceptance that my child cannot have mental illness how is it even possible so this lack of awareness this lack of understanding and acceptance by the parents makes it more gross and makes it more difficult for the child to deal with the mental health condition right mental illness she is faking this is another very commonly uh, you know said things we say we get to hear particularly if it is if, if uh, the mental illness is part of personality disorder where the individual is quite functional in terms of other aspects the individual is able to study the individual is able to watch movies uh, you know talk to friends go out but has you know difficulties that are you know very different level particularly when it comes to personality disorder parents often feel that you know she is faking or he is faking okay they think that if the if my child is able to uh, you know fairly do well in social media clicking pictures posting talking to friends is he or, he or she is eating he or she is sleeping sometimes sleeping sometimes not it's fine i mean what what kind of a problem he or she has absolutely fake you know there are parents who come and tell us that uh, i mean this is one of the patient uh, who has uh, uh, whose whose daughter has a uh, uh, multiple personality condition in the sense that she has uh, uh, what do you call the multiple personality i mean it's not a split personality it's not the dissociative identity disorder i'm talking about she has mixed personality that means when we talk about in icd when we have different you know different types of specific personality disorders the individual is found to have traits of overlapping more than one Uh, you know sub type of specific personality disorder so that's a condition called mixed personality disorder you know the 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 mother she comes and tells me that ma'am she is actually faking and she is actually you know fooling you she doesn't have any problem okay so this is the perspective the the child uh, i mean the child is all i mean although she is 22 years old now but this is a this is the you know individual challenge that she has to keep facing in the in the family on a 24 hours you know spectrum around the clock this is what she keeps getting to hear okay mental illness what are we going to say this to our relatives i mean if there is any other condition if you have uh, diabetes if you have hypertension if you have broken your hand if you have broken your leg if you have hit, hit your head somewhere if you have a stitch um anything can be done i mean we can tell this to our relative but how can we go and tell this to our relative i mean they see mental health is such a punishment that my goodness i mean how can i go and you know show my face in front of people and this is what i mean these perspectives are making it more difficult for the individual to live with a mental health condition then to live with a mental health condition in itself okay very commonly said you don't need therapy your mental is strong people think that mental illness is something to do with mental weakness people think that if the individual is mentally weak only those people get mental health issues okay a lot of time parents come and tell us that you know ma'am he or she doesn't have any problem you don't you don't worry she is or he is absolutely mentally very strong you just you know help out help him or help him out or help her out with the problem mentally he is very fine so these are the perspectives that we get to see every day and one of the most i think uh, in in one of my you know seven years of career is one of the most uh, what do you call it? i mean hard breaking or such difficult thing to hear which i really wanted to quote in my next slide so a parent of a borderline personality disorder patient comes and tells me this if she dies of suicide how will i carry her body down to the basement and carry it for the funeral 
what will I tell people for her reason of death? I think this particular statement in itself makes everything go silent. We understand the kind of you know societal challenge an individual with mental health or mental health is is challengingly living with. We see the hostility, we see the shame, we see the uh, uh, you know so much of negativity involved with it. An individual, the mother is not concerned that I'm going to lose my daughter. What will I do if I lose my daughter to suicide? But she's more concerned that how will I take her body down to the basement and carry her for the funeral? I think this particular statement sums up every kind of perspective, every kind of, you know, and these are absolutely true stories. These are not inspired from any book. This is, in, this is purely, purely, uh, you know, uh, that I get to hear from, uh, you know, from my clinical practice. It's not inspired from any book. But we have to see the kind of, you know, hostility and individual faces. So, you know, as a, as a whole, then we see, when we talk about suicide as just a symptom of a mental health, but more than that, or equally important, or equally it's a consequence of the kind of stigmatized mental health perspective the society has. For the patient, it's not a depression, it's not a psychiatric illness, it's not the borderline personality, it's not the uh, coping mechanism, or it's not the bipolar affective disorder which is causing distress to the person. But more distressing it is for the patient to deal with the family or how they see their family member having a mental health condition. And when we talk about uh, having, a, you know, having a suicidal, I mean, prevention, when we talk about having a lot of um, uh, awareness in order to uh, prevent suicide, the major thing that we'll have to work on a very first level is, of course, a ground groundwork I and mean, ground root work are absolutely important where we are working from a very lower level, then we are going up uh, to a high levels of awareness. But the very important thing when we talk about suicidal awareness and uh, uh, you know prevention are the protective factors, right? So when we talk about uh, risk management and suicide, we always talk about these two things, risk factors and protective factors. Risk factors are all those factors which precipitate or which predisposes the individual to cause a self-harming behavior or to you know, have a suicidal ideation or a suicidal behavior. And protective factors are those which actually protects an individual and inhibits the person to go towards such a drastic uh, you know, behavior for themselves and for others, in fact, right? So protective factors mostly include the social support, the kind of family support the individual needs to have, the interpersonal you know, support the individual needs to have, uh, better health, better positive mental well-being and so on. But the most important thing uh, to work as a protective factor is the entire perspective of positive societal attitude towards mental health would be proved the most important and most significant protective factor for people who are living with mental health conditions. Let, I mean, you know, setting aside just suicide. If you just talk about mental health condition, we need to have more of a protective factor when the society is developing a more of accepting and positive attitude towards mental health. And that will directly and indirectly will always be the most protective factor when it comes to suicidal prevention and so on. So uh, with this, I'm you know, trying to sum up with what kind of an idea I really wanted to spread across today. And there are so many you know, frequently asked questions that we would want to you know, get onto this uh, platform today. So I request the moderator to you know begin with the questions and then we can you know discuss a few things more in specific. Yeah. Uh, so ma'am, we have the first question as that what are the societal trends uh, in India today? And uh, do you think that if we assess and manage the societal ideation on time, it can prevent mm -hmm. suicide and it can contribute to a mental better mental well-being for the individual? Right. I'll, I'll answer like, you know, uh, the second part first. I mean, when WHO yeah. talks about suicide, it talks about suicide as a very serious public health condition. And uh, mm -hmm. the WHO uh, posits that, you know, it's highly, highly preventable if we have the intervention at the right time. 
And when we mm-hmm. talk about awareness, when we talk about suicide prevention, we have to be be very very strong and uh, very particular in having the interventions at the right time. So of course, you know, uh, assessing suicidal behavior or assessing suicidal ideations are different across different perspectives. As in, if I am a professional, my way of uh, assessing the suicidal ideations will be different from someone who is a you know person the common. Uh, uh you know in the, a common person in the society who sees a colleague or a friend some kind of a change in their behavior okay so understanding that behavior is very different from professional or the individual to individual okay but yes assessing those suicidal ideations are very important and how we do it uh, at, as a common factor like you know when we are working in our uh, workplace we meet people we are like you know general public Okay, so how general public, how common person can actually uh, bring into a notice or raise a red flag of you know seeing someone having or undergoing some kind mm-hmm. of a change, some you know very aggressive mm-hmm. behavior, high irritability, or some kind of a sudden change in the behavior of the individual. So it's a comparison of the individual's behavior with their you know earlier behavior to the behavior the individual is currently into. this is this assessment is not only for suicidal ideation or suicidal behavior but mental health perspective as a whole yeah okay yeah so as a, a lot of times we also have psychological first aid training now it is becoming a very important mm-hmm. thing particularly after this pandemic hit and when we have the incidence of a lot of mental health conditions during this pandemic and post this pandemic uh, so we have a lot of the psychological first aid training which is purely purely meant for the common people to first identify because since we have a huge dearth of you know professionals and there's very less amount of awareness that if i am feeling this way where do i need to go they don't know inside right yeah. so this yeah. psychological first aid training serves as a very important bridge between you know connecting the professionals and the individuals who are in need so that is a very constructive and a very focused way of uh, uh, you know uh, causing uh, awareness at the same time we have early identification so yes change in behavior a uh, very erratic you know erratic uh, anger uh, irritability uh, changes in the way they present themselves okay uh, so that is a very important you know signs to talk about that is is this person doing well or this person needs some kind mm-hmm. of a help talking about trend i think i have certain uh, you know data in my hand just to talk about uh, i'll just give a brief uh, global and uh, you know perspective and uh, particular uh, and india in particular so kind of when you talk about trends there are so many things to take care of there are gender trends there are you know trends based mm-hmm. on the socio economic background there are trends in terms of uh, uh, the the method used for uh, you know uh, method used in the societal behavior uh, the education level and so on okay so the few things which i would like to uh, talk about is the latest yeah. data that we have of worldwide and in india is 2019 okay and it has been found that 77% of suicide are occurring in the lower and the middle economic income countries it's a uh, you know the data by 2019 and uh, suicide is reported for 1.3 of all the deaths that are occurring you know worldwide and it stands as a 17th leading cause of death you know in the world mm-hmm. when we see particularly in india we see a you know uh, kind of data such as we are we have uh, 381 deaths by suicide on a daily basis in 2019 okay there has been a record of 139123 fatalities over the year according to the national crime records bureau so ncrb uh, they are the you know major uh, you know data provider when we comes to you know uh, uh, aspects of these and this is the data of 2019 there has been an average increase of 3.4% of increase uh, when we compare to the average of 2017-18 okay mm-hmm. so there's a increase by 3.4% uh, when we talk about the trends of suicide in terms of the methodologies uh, uh, you know taken or the approach that have been utilized suicide by hanging is around 53.6% so of all the suicidal data that we have in india we find that 53.6% are caused by hanging uh, caused by consuming poison is around 25.8% drowning is around 5.2% uh, 
and self emulation is around 3.8 percent. Mm -hmm. Talking about the probable reasons that precipitating factors, okay, the risk factors which are involved in the uh, uh, in the uh, you know suicidal uh, conditions, around 32.4 percent are been accounted for family problems. Now these family problems are yeah. away from, I mean it it, it excludes some marriage marriage related issues, okay. So the data yeah. is such that family problems and marital problems have actually, you know, put separately. Mm -hmm. So only family mm -hmm. problems, excluding marriage-related issues, are found to be 32.4%. And marriage-related mm -hmm. issues are around 5.5%. And illness. Now, illness can be part of any physical illness or mental illness, which mm -hmm. is causing around 17.1%. So when mm -hmm. I just begin talking about, you know, suicide as a symptom, so we have to understand and in, we have data for this, right? We have data, suicide as a consequence of a particular you know, life event and suicide as a consequence of some kind of a health issue, mm -hmm. be it mental health mm -hmm. issue or a physical health issue. Mm -hmm. When it comes to uh, male and female understanding, gender understanding, particularly in India, the data goes in such way that out of 100, 100 cases, an average of 70.2% are male and 29.8% are considered to be female. But we see that the attempt of suicide is more in female. I exactly do not have the data for that, but attempt of suicide, mm -hmm. the attempt of self-harming behavior mm -hmm. and, or attempt of, on those, I mean, of course, those are uh, uh, like you know, unsuccessful attempts, but attempts mm -hmm. are more found in female than in male. But, you know, uh, causing particular, you know, causing death by suicide is found mm -hmm. to be more in male in a country of ours. Okay. When we see a, uh, division in India, we see that in Maharashtra has the highest, uh, you know, suicidal um, cases causing around uh, 18,916 cases of death caused by suicide, followed by Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, Madhya Pradesh and Karnataka. So these five states together, they account for 49.5% of suicides in India. And rest of the 50.5% are coming from the rest of the 24 uh, states and the UN mm -hmm. Union territories. But this five states itself, they are accounting to 49.5% of total suicidal cases in India. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, I just had a follow-up question on the data that you are sharing. So as you said that we noticed that your the high suicide rates are mostly in, you know, the metropolitan cities where we say that the resources are very accessible and, you know, mm -hmm. we can reach out to people very easily in comparison to the rural areas. So what mm -hmm. would be the, you know, reasons behind having such a high rate of suicide in specifically the metropolitan cities? When we, uh, you know, right. the percentage of having the professionals are more than when it comes right. to the uh, right. other states. Right. Actually, there is no particular, you know, clean study when we talk about that. There is a clear distinction between, you know, difference of uh, uh, numbers coming from rural and uh, urban areas. There is no clear cut understanding because even when we see as literates and illiterate, so we consider that, you know, in metropolitan cities we have more of literates, but we see that, mm -hmm. you know, even in literates, the uh, you know percentage of suicide is more. Mm -hmm. Talking about yeah. the metropolitan city, the major aspect is competition. The work yeah. stress, the stress which is you know coming all across you know uh, ba balancing a life between work and uh, you know life mm -hmm. and so on, right? Although professionals they are literate, they are highly educated, they are into you know they are mm -hmm. holding on to good job, but with increase in yeah. responsibility, there are enormous amount of increase in their job stress, you know stress in terms of other aspects as well, and mm -hmm. the kind of stigmas are also more. You know, it's it's quite un it's quite uh, interesting to understand that. Even we have educated people, the stigma is not uh, being curbed down with education. That's a very interesting thing that we see. Mm -hmm. In fact, when, mm -hmm. we, when we see that, uh, you know, uh, when we have a society, they are more stigmatized to talk about mental health, to talk about, you know, depression. They find it more mm -hmm. uh, difficult to address than people mm -hmm. in the rural areas. I mean, rural areas, they don't even know. Okay, yeah. They don't even know what a depression is, what a... OCD is or what it would likely to be, but in uh, yeah. urban uh, urban areas or in the you know high end societies, they are like you know they know about it, but still they hide it. Mm -hmm. So we have two you know aspects of stigma. One is you know the absolute unawareness, and the other is awareness, but still they are not taking it at the right spirit. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So this some kind of a very mixed picture about this, and of course, uh, you know, in in uh, metropolitan uh, and the high, like you know, uh, super tier uh, uh, cities and places like Maharashtra, where we have you know very huge amount of employment opportunities, where we have huge amount of uh, 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 you know uh, very high end societies and so on, but still it's not because. uh you know the kind of mental health perspectives or mental health initiatives taken up by the respective workplaces are also something that we have to see mm. right i mean uh, one of the major things like one of my friends he works with google and you know how they have uh, he wants had mentioned that how they are so much particular in maintaining yeah. the mental health of an, of their you know employees and it's just not you know doing some kind of a random hr uh, team building activity or you know rangoli activity or painting activity or something mm-hmm. like that but you know mental health interventions are very right and the true spirit i'm not saying that you know uh, uh, hr team building activities not going to help but these are something something very generic we keep doing it even mm-hmm. if there is a need or there is no need of it but mm-hmm. in google what i come to hear from him is that you know they are so much uh, they understand first the need of what kind of a requirement they mm-hmm. have when it comes to mental health intervention and then they you know provide it okay now this mm-hmm. mental health intervention doesn't mean that people have problem but it is just mm-hmm. as a preventive mechanism yeah. so that people do not feel stressed yeah. people they do not you know uh, uh, you know end up having a poor mental health condition it's like one of the steps in suicide management yes absolutely absolutely and it's like you know how we you know the reason why we go to a gym because we want to stay physically yeah. fit right so there are yeah. lot of you yeah. know such uh, technique uh, you know exercises mental mm-hmm. health exercises through which we can keep our mental health fit So it's just a way of doing it. So I guess uh, that's another reason, okay? Because yeah. you know, when we talk about education trend, we see that there are twelve point six percent of uh, suicides. They are illiterate, okay? But sixteen point three percent of them are primary level education, and nineteen point six are middle level education. Mm. And very surprisingly, people who are at least matriculate, they are you know tenth pass. they have 23.3% in fact that is little more but again yeah. when it comes to graduate and above we see a very small of 3.7% of suicide so if you mm-hmm. see there is no particular trend to understand ki okay there is less mm-hmm. education it, it's causing mm-hmm. more of suicide no, we cannot actually you know uh, comment anything or we cannot do anything yeah. yeah right because so there are so much following the yeah Yeah, so I'm following the suicide management. So, do you support that parents should inculcate these kind of conversation with their children? And uh, how do they do that? Like on a general level, like how do okay. they do that? And what is the right age to talk about these sensitive? Because on the other hand, it can be a possibility that uh, the ch- child is getting ideations. just because mm-hmm. of the conversation he or she has may never thought about it before but mm-hmm. just because the parents had the conversation the idea has been uh, implanted in their brains so what is the right way when it comes to the family level to go about it right uh to be honest it's actually just not because the individual the family members are talking about it will not exactly lead to suicidal ideation in case the child doesn't have any other problem mm-hmm. okay Hmm. I mean, if the talks are healthy and talks are, you know, yeah. very much, you know, awareness based, and they, hmm. uh, they, you know, they have some, there's some kind of a transparent, transparency in hmm. talking about it. Okay. Hmm. So when we tend to hide something, children or people, uh, you know, we have we humans, we have the tendency of getting more curious about it. But more we talk hmm. about it and more we normalize it. they know and we we are you know doing a uh, awareness at a much more constructive and a light uh, you know direction okay so i feel that uh, it's just not about talking about suicide but talking about mental health should actually you know begin from a very very early time in whatever level the child understands okay yeah. having a routine life is also one of the one of a very major aspect of uh, uh, you know contributing towards the positive mental health routine having a routine okay maintaining a proper you know toilet training pr- maintaining a proper diet okay mm. communication talking even mm. if they are talking about a uh, you know story like a monkey and a frog because there is a talking because they are they they are the parents they are supposed to uh, form a foundation of communication between the parent and the child from a very very yeah. young age 
okay even if it, the child is around uh, why not just one and a half for two years when the, there is a constant communication with the child not only it is impacting his uh, speech development imagination uh, you know uh, better cognitive skills better uh, you know uh, mental health strengths and so on mm-hmm. but it is majorly forming a foundation that i can speak mm-hmm. to my parents i have the spirit mm-hmm. i i share that kind of a bond that i can mm-hmm. speak to my parents about things so just communication just talk the communication has to be no barrier it's not that the communication mm-hmm. will only happen when the child reaches around uh, the age of adolescence and then we start talking about it no because we have to form a base where we have mm-hmm. to speak about much difficult and much uh, you know sensitive things later in the mm-hmm. adolescence at the pre adolescence time so the rapport has should be built from very beginning yeah. so the rapport yeah. communication is very important so that itself will actually form a foundation and a cushion for the parents to mm. initiate much sensitive talk at the later mm. age of their children like you know pre adolescents yeah. or adolescents and when we talk mm. about you know as the children they are growing up you know starting to talk about bad touch good touch trying to talk about you know uh, uh, having a uh, time for your play having a time for so all these routine as well these are also part of mental health and communicating them okay. why we are doing why we are talking mm. about it okay mm-hmm. and whenever you have something how can you come and speak to me okay mm-hmm. so all these part all these things are part of this entire mental health communication process and it needs to be mm-hmm. done in a way that uh, it is it is understandable by the child okay a lot so of times parents come in from the early ages on absolutely absolutely yeah. absolutely because i deal with a lot of you know uh, uh, developmental cases you know ch- child cases mm-hmm. and things like that usually mm-hmm. parents they have a feeling that you know uh, ma'am if we go and tell them these things how would they understand it's okay we can yeah. break anything possible and we can explain it in a way or in a level the child will understand we can always do that yeah. we can always do that mm-hmm. okay for example talking mm-hmm. about bad touch and good touch the content is always same but the how how we you know make a small child understand about it and how we explain an adolescence about it is very different right but we can yeah. always okay so uh, starting from that is important and slowly as the child is growing up we have to you know keep presenting things one by one in a way the child mm-hmm. understands and in an environment which is very safe the child needs to feel that safety and comfort with the parents that mm-hmm. okay i can speak about these things otherwise mm-hmm. a lot of issues of domestic violence or sexual assault or abuse in childhood they, it goes unnoticed and the, and the children they are very scared to go and tell this to the parents that you know yes. what will i go and tell but yeah. the communication the the bed of communication should have been actually set at a very young mm-hmm. age so that as the child is growing up they know that anything is happening mm-hmm. i can go back to my parents and talk about it mm-hmm. so this is actually a huge process ever yeah. since the communication yeah. begins with the child and the parents i think it i think the entire process sets even there Yeah. So, ma'am, the next question is: We have one from the audience that uh, is the behavior of self harm can uh, have any other intention than have than the suicidal ideation? Like, is it uh, mandatory that self harm will only lead to suicide, and the particular person is uh, engaged in that behavior due to in- intention to suicide, or it can have other reasons as well? so the question is uh, is self harm is only a, a method of uh, uh, you know uh, taking one's life or it could be some it could have some yeah, other it could meaning be, it could have some other yes. intention as well yeah yes yes a uh, self harm could have numerous different interpretation not every time it okay. is you know taking someone someone's life like mm-hmm. it's not that you know i'm feeling worthless and i feel i don't have the mm-hmm. urge to live and that's why i'm doing a self harm no mm-hmm. it's not like that it's not always like that self harm can have numerous interpretation it could be a way to uh, draw attention it could be a way to uh, you know get things resolved in the way he or she wants mm-hmm. it could be a way to express anger it could be a way to uh, you know way of self expression in fact forget yeah. about anger just a way of self expression it could be because people yeah. when they have a very improper and maladaptive uh, ways of communication and you know the person is in need of something and is not able to communicate so i think they uh, develop any kind of a maladaptive way to bring that attention mm-hmm. to and talk about it mm-hmm. so self harm becomes a result anger okay anger mm-hmm. impulses you know something is going wrong i don't know what to do and just you know self harming mm-hmm. is occurring okay 
lot of times the behavioral issues that we see in uh, adolescents self harming is also a way to you know communicate what they want communicating their needs mm-hmm. so the 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 example of the child that i gave of a 13 years so in order to communicate his needs he has taken up self harming as a way although okay. the you know slits are slits are so much super, superficial and it's on the upper epidermis of the skin but mm-hmm. then they are you know they can cause harm at any time they can lead to any other yeah. kind of illness infection and any yeah. other kind of a fatalistic condition if just not uh, you know uh, self harm leading to taking away of life but it can lead mm-hmm. to any other condition right mm-hmm. so yes self harm mm-hmm. when we there is when we when we say a lot of times people what they do they call us and say ki uh, ma'am my daughter or my son or my family member has self harm ma'am just give us some tips how to control it but yeah. we cannot do it because we have to assess why the self harming is happening Yes. is it a part of yes. some kind a lot of times it part, could be a part of a dissociative disorder it could be a part of mm-hmm. behavioral disorder it could be a part of personality disorder mm-hmm. it could be a part of emotional dysregulation could be a part of um, mm-hmm. mood and affective disorder so we need to understand self harming behavior so much in depth to go ahead and formulate the therapy and an intervention plan so it's very See, important we also got to yeah so from this we also got to know that depression is the no- is not the only reason of his and his idealization yeah absolutely not okay. absolutely not. it's not uh, the so only I'm moving thing. forward yeah yeah so i'm moving forward to the way the media showcases suicide and suicide ideation do you think mm-hmm. it is one of the causes of uh, you know like increase amount of you know because uh, how in movies and in you know media how suicide ideation is glorified sometimes so can it be one mm-hmm. of the causes of increased rates of suicide in teenagers especially uh, right so it's a very complicated thing to answer just in a straight way but then yeah. also yeah. we need to say that whenever media is uh, showcasing suicide and yeah. they have an intensity of or they have an intention to actually spread a message of awareness mm. i mean that needs to be dealt in a more sensitive way okay it needs to be dealt in a more sensitive and uh, way and it needs to carry a lot of strong positive message and not something that we yeah. are actually supporting it number 2 there are also ways like uh, when instances of uh, 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 suicide in celebrity or you know uh, uh, in a public figure occur yeah. there is some kind of a social learning which also occurs okay forget about just uh, uh, you know uh, uh, celebrity figures like the the, the kind of yeah. example which i had given to you that the 13 year old child he had seen his mother committing you know uh, self harm mm-hmm. right so causing mm-hmm. self harm so that has become a social learning for the child so if you see it in mm-hmm. the bigger picture we also have this particular uh you know stress or tendency if suicide mm. if it is not showcased in a sensitive way it could also lead to us a uh, social learning mechanism mm. right so that's why these things need to be dealt with a lot of uh, you know precision lot of uh, sensitivity mm. and lot of uh, uh, you know lot of care and lot of uh, we have to be mm. particular when we are showcasing these uh, aspects when we are talking about these aspects because we are uh, letting it you know open for a huge public mm-hmm. coming from different education background coming from different socio economic background coming from different understanding level coming from different family issues and so on. right so that is very important so media i think when they have a very important role to spread awareness but at the same time when they do it they have to be like you know extra careful and we yeah. need to yeah, a lot of uh, yeah right yeah. So, ma'am, we have a last question from the audience. Is that uh, uh, what is the working of a suicide helpline? Like, a lot of people face this issues that when they are actually in need and they want to call on a suicide helpline, they actually don't get answered. The 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 calls are not being directed to the main center, or mm-hmm. even uh, like before calling, they are very hesitant about you know what would be what would they say and what is exactly. exact procedure and how mm. the things go there right uh see honestly to tell you about this uh, the suicide helpline condition in india it still needs to a lot of things needs to be worked upon okay although yeah. we have i think we have very leading institutes in india who are doing very well in uh, yes. maintaining a suicide helpline yeah. 
but as a professional and as a person who is uh, like uh, uh, as a person who is actively working in the spread of awareness mm-hmm. and mental health care of the society as a whole i have to really mention a very important point here at a public platform like this now what happens in india the people who are actually working in those suicide helplines they are number one not well trained okay okay uh the psychological first aid training uh it's not adequately spread in india at all hmm yes ma'am the gate keeping training is happening but uh, we have to do a lot we still have to go a long and long way to do this yeah okay? and uh, although they get paid like sorry they a lot of organization ask a lot great amount to attend a gate keepers training so a lot of people yeah, back yeah. they have to pay for right. their own mental well being right 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 so it's very difficult so it's a very yeah. huge vicious circle yeah. number 2 i have also seen people so what what has happened uh, is when they uh, when they hire or they employ people to take care of the suicide mm. helplines they are very mm. young students who are like you know working as intern okay okay they are they think that you know a lot of uh, suicide helpline uh, organizations they think that it's okay just take a call say hello how are you just you know do a few rapport building questions and you have just said those questions na huh? okay, this is what you have to ask where are you right yeah. now who is exactly yeah. around you what part of the house you are and so on and so forth so they are just you no know, set of yeah. questions set and these are the things that you need to ask but okay what is the mental health condition of that particular individual who is taking those calls okay they are not trained they are not endured to take up those calls every call cause cause a lot of mental health issues on the call on the one that who are dealing with, with these calls themselves okay so that's a very gross thing i mean uh, uh, i i had a patient uh, that is back in around the, uh, four or five years ago so he was working yeah. in a suicide helpline uh, organization so they were taking calls like you know uh, all over the world okay so mm-hmm. uh, through that call uh, so there was this r- a girl from russia she, she used to you know call him regularly and you know talk about her problems gradually yeah. they turned friends they turned friends and they exchanged their personal numbers they used to talk yes and since the individual the girl had a uh, suicidal behavior and ideation so one day she had called him up he was busy with his exams and uh, the next moment uh, i mean they could not talk after that so the guy he was like oh i have to call her back so he was calling her back and he did not find any answer two days later he finds that that girl has you know had, had, she's dead by suicide okay now this kind of trauma this boy has experienced mm-hmm. that has led him to dissociative amnesia he was a student okay. of class 12 and he was a student of class 12 it happened somewhere in the month of february and from the mar- 4th of march his uh, that's a pre covid then so 4th of march his votes were on due he could not yeah. appear for his vote okay he could not appear for his vote now mental health agencies or the people who are running these men- uh, the suicide call uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know helplines they need to understand mm-hmm. that who are these people who are dealing with these calls how trained they mm-hmm. are how mentally endured they are to take these calls mm-hmm. what kind of resource these uh, you know uh, i would i would call these children or i would call this young you know interns or young people who are taking these calls because when we deal with um, uh, you know site with the, the suicide helplines we need to have a wider network of people it's just not taking calls yes. a lot of times yeah. we also have that you know there there are calls we take the address and we also send someone in physically to the you know to visit the individual in person yeah. while yeah. we are on call so i don't yeah. think we have that amount of a network still set people think that you know mm-hmm. okay we have a mm-hmm. setup we have this room we have you know num- uh, you know multiple phones and we have taken a lot of sim cards mm-hmm. there will be people coming and you know calling now these things you see our society is getting a lot aware okay we are aware mm-hmm. of those quacks we are aware of people who are into yeah. unethical practices that is again causing a peop- lot of people to be hesitant to talk to mental health professionals they do not know okay. who am i talking to who am i speaking to what if i am speaking to someone and this person is a quack right so they have yeah. that hesitation 
apart from the hesitation to talk about mental health because of the stigmas attached, there's also a hesitation because of the fear attached that with whom I'm talking. If I start sharing mm. my problem, is the person educated enough or licensed clinical psychologist or is just someone who is just talking to me and so on, right? Yes. So there's yes. so many things to take care of and I feel that mm. someday, I think I would also appeal psychologues, uh, uh, you know, uh, organization being such a, you know, enormously doing work yeah. in the field of mental health to come up something with this particular aspect of having a suicide helpline, which is very organized and you know even yeah. i would really love to be a part of you know making things a uh, very important yeah. in our country yes. because it's very important it's just not people think that mental health is a very easy thing you know only yeah, we have to talk easy. people think that you know baat hi to karni hai hum log baat karenge yeah. counseling ho jayegi my goodness yeah. i don't know where when would be see a society where we are more aware about this but i'm really hoping that we have a very good future ahead and we are all working in this i mean we are uh, yeah. a, a kind of initiative that your organization has yeah. come up with a lot of things would definitely help but yes uh, when it comes to suicidal helplines i think we need to be more organized we need to be more trained we need to be more systematic mm-hmm. in dealing the whole mechanism as a whole because mm-hmm. just in order to receive a few calls from people in distress should not make the mm-hmm. you know the receivers in distress yes. because they yes. don't know what to do they yes. don't know what yeah. to do they don't know how to react to this yes. i mean how would they face someone right yeah so in our Very practice right. we do we do uh, uh, lose mm-hmm. patients to suicide right yeah. but we have yeah. to be trained accordingly that how enduringly we are taking right mm-hmm. even in you know in in the medical professions people uh, die during the surgery or some kind of a, mm-hmm. you know health condition mm-hmm. maybe in the middle of surgery because of a mm-hmm. stroke or maybe some other kind of it's a lot of things mm-hmm. happen and medical professionals mm-hmm. they do the best that they can right mm-hmm. they they do their best now in cases of uh, our profession we are clinical psychologists we do lose patients to uh, mm-hmm. to suicide right but how do we take it how do we yeah. take it a small uh, you know this young in johns who come and you know they want to work on these health plans they'll definitely get you know they'll feel incapacitated they'll feel so overwhelmed yeah. my goodness i was t- yeah. speaking to this person and this person is no more maybe i could mm-hmm. not do best for this a lot of young yeah. psychologists when they are you know in the process of becoming uh, psychologists they have this they they take this responsibility that you know uh, i have to cure someone if someone yeah. is getting yeah. deteriorated my goodness am i responsible for it yeah right yeah so that is the kind of i think the actual aspect of empathy comes into where we mm-hmm. have to be mm-hmm. absolutely be supportive absolutely be you know uh, working towards the upliftment and the betterment of the client but at the same time we also draw a very important boundary in yeah. order to help ourselves from the mental health you know mm-hmm. issues mm-hmm. and that is yes. an endurance which actually brings about with a lot of training and experience so i think that is one of the major thing that we need to take care in india in order to make the entire mental health feel little more strengthened and more structured yeah so mom i would like to extend my warmest gratitude to you it was a lovely session i personally learned a lot of things from you and i'm thank sure you, the thank you so much watching it live must have uh, you know enlightened their info knowledge and information as well so right. i would like thank to thank you, you, thank you so for much. coming on this platform yeah and i would also thank like to so uh, thank that clocks magazine to provide us with this platform thank you so much right. ma'am it was a lovely thank you session. so much i really had a great time speaking to yeah. the audience and all of you i think a, a lot of initiative of this kind are required mm-hmm. so that we can yes, you know uh, make this mental health scenario a lot better yeah. in our country yeah. and i think it's an individual effort from all of us yes, to make ma'am. a lot of change and this is with yes, this particular ma'am. you know note i guess we really look forward for a very brighter yeah. mental health future yeah. that we can do a lot of things for our society to go yes, ahead ma'am. right yes ma'am thank you so much thank, thank you so, so much. much i really ma'am. had a great time yeah. take care thank you